So I, I think we should start. Uh, so um, it's really a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, plenary session. The first part of the session is devoted to BEH mechanism and uh, we will have reports from the experiments and uh, also the a review with the point of view from the theoreticians. And uh, let me tell you that the organizers uh, have given seven additional minutes to the experimental talks from ATLAS and CMS. That means that, uh, well, the whole session uh, will be a little bit longer than what you have in the, in the agenda. Uh, okay, so our first speaker is Marumi Kado, presenting the results from the ATLAS experiment. Thank you very much, Tere. So, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation to this fantastic location. I will talk this morning about Higgs physics in ATLAS. And uh, as this is the second anniversary of the discovery of the Higgs boson, I just wanted to, to show you in uh, just one quick slide the evolution and the timeline of the discovery. And you can see that in essentially one, one, one and a half year between summer 2011 and summer 2012, um, the discovery was made and announced at the, the last IHEP in 2012. And now what I will try to um, discuss with you is the fact that we've gone uh, to now a completely different uh, era. Um, and this is the time of the measurements of the Higgs boson. So the landscape of the Higgs uh, physics have completely been redefined, essentially, and since, this is since 2012, and it's gone into several, several aspects of, uh, of, uh, of um, experimental physics. So here it's essentially first the precision with several measurements, the mass and the width of the Higgs boson, the coupling properties, quantum numbers, differential cross-sections, offshed couplings, and width. Uh, uh, constraints and even interferometry. I will try to, to, to touch base on most of these points. Looking also for rare decays that uh, are extremely difficult, extremely challenging at uh, this period of the LHC, but of course are extremely important for the future. For instance, the um, Z gamma uh, decay of the Higgs boson, the dimuon, uh, and, and, and others. It is also, the Higgs boson uh, is also, as uh, put in the words of the P5 uh, report, a tool for discovery, and it's a portal to dark matter, for instance. This, these are extremely important analyses that we, uh, that we are uh, uh, pursuing uh, at the LHC and in Atlas in particular. And it's portal other to, also to other hidden sectors, and for instance, to hidden valley pions or dark Zs. Uh, it is also an, an extremely important question to know if the um, uh, electroweak symmetry breaking sector that we are facing with the uh, Higgs boson here is minimal or not, and for instance, search for 2HDM uh, additional states or in the framework of the MSSM or an MSSM, or even in doubly charged Higgs boson searches. So of course, with such an extremely large program, I will not cover all the subjects that are here, but I will try to list them at least very quickly in the end. And all this has been possible uh, through the collaboration of more than 3,000 scientists and over 178 institutes and 38 countries. And here you have a list, and this talk is based on a wonderful team of uh, parallel session talks. And you have the list of these parallel session talks here for the Higgs, and more, of course, with CP, Standard Model, Electroweak, and QCD talks, which are extremely important to the, to the field of uh, Higgs physics now. So we've, we've had three years of remarkable LHC operation at the energy frontier between 7 and 8 TV. You have the timeline here in terms of the peak uh, interaction uh, per, 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 cross, uh, per, per, cross, per beam crossings. And you see also for each of the three years, 2010, 2011, 2012, the, uh, the number of interactions per bunch crossing that have been, has been reached and the integrated luminosity. So the total amount of uh, data uh, taken was about 25 in the center barn. And you can see that at the highest luminosity, we've reached a, a number of pylon events averaging over 20. And here you have an event, for instance, at 13. And, and of course, these are extremely challenging and difficult conditions. They are challenging for the trigger to, to be able to select uh, more than 400 uh, events per second out of the 20 million that, that, uh, that, are, uh, that uh, occur uh, every second. 
And of course, having 400 of these extremely uh, heavy events is a challenge for the computing, and, uh, and we have reached over 120 petabytes of data and simulation uh, in Atlas. And of course, uh, just to, to, to show uh, in, in numbers the challenging trigger conditions, but how we've, we've overcame them, you can see, for instance, the example rates uh, that we have uh, for several typical triggers here. And uh, a, a nice feature of the Atlas trigger system is that we've been able to hold a threshold of the single lepton within 5 GeV throughout the entire luminosity period. The take, data taking efficiency uh, uh, has been uh, of 94%, with a data quality selection of 94% as well, which uh, added up to about 90% data taking overall efficiency. A few Atlas performance highlights, for instance, in, the, in the, the reconstruction of the electrons and the muons, and you can see, for instance, the measurement with tag and probe of the electron efficiency as a function of the transverse energy, or for the muons of the transverse momentum. These are extremely important quantities, in particular, going to low PT and low energy transverse energy is extremely important for the reconstruction of the Higgs in two four leptons. And, and you see that these are measured on the data with Z, J, Psi, and also radiative Z events. Here, a plot showing the performance, for instance, of the jet, um, jet vertex uh, tagging uh, in, in high pileup conditions. And you can see that our working point here has a, a very nice rejection for an excellent efficiency. And finally, for the transverse missing energy, you can, missing energy, you can see, for instance, the, uh, the performance of, of the soft term in the missing ET reconstruction um, when it's uh, estimated using a correction based on tracks. Also, an important feature of, uh, of, uh, of, of being able to tag events at, uh, in Atlas is the reconstruction of the um, B vertex. And, and for this, it's extremely important, given the high pileup condition, to be able to uh, detect and, uh, and split and merge clusters from different tracks. So for instance, in, in Atlas, and you will see there's a, there's a new uh, paper just, uh, uh, which could, just came out about our neural network-based uh, pixel clustering uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the first layers of our uh, tracking device. And uh, it's based on neural networks, and you see that we have a reduction in the number of shared heats of a factor of three. So this is, this is extremely important for B-tagging, and you see here, as a function of the JetPT, the, uh, the efficiency for tagging B-jet, which is measured in uh, TT-bar events, dilepton with different flavor dilepton events, where both B-jets are uh, semi-leptonic decays. And you see that uh, we have a systematic of uncertainty on the efficiency of B-jets that reaches 2% at about 100 GV. This, of course, is critical for many of our analyses. And uh, a final performance highlight about TAUs, and you can see that TAU reconstruction with an efficiency of 40% and a background rejection of about 2%. And, and this is a performance which is obtained with a neural network-based TAU identification, which is extremely stable as, uh, as a function of pileup. And you can see this in these plots of efficiency and rejection as a function of pileup. We, we have also the tau energy scale, which is measured in situ. And you can see the, uh, the nice uh, reconstruction of the Z-peak uh, applying this tau energy scale. And, uh, and, and the entire landscape is, is well described. So I will go to my first and, and extremely important physics topic of the Higgs. And this is the measurement of the Higgs boson mass. And of course, the, the measurement of the Higgs boson mass is based mostly on, uh, on the calibration of, of the detector. And to start with, I will discuss in one slide just the muon cal momentum calibration. So the muons in the four lepton events are essentially based on a combination of the ID and the muon system. And there's been a main effort, of course, the main effort in the reconstructing the momentum of the, uh, of the, uh, of the muons is to align the, uh, the ID and the muon system. And the calibration in situ has been made using 9 million Zs and uh, 6 million J size uh, with, the, with a simultaneous fit of, of the entire data. And you can see that the result is the calibration here. And you can see that uh, essentially uh, all, the, all the data points are included within about 0 0.1, 0 0.1 per mil in, in, in a large PT range and a large eta range as well. Of course, here you have, you can see in this plot that we have the Z events and the J Psi events. 
but the, the sample has a larger sample of JSI, six, six million compared to 17 million, and essentially the, uh, the uh, cross-check is done using epsilons. We have five million epsilons. While, of course, for the Z and, and the JSI, this is more of a closer check. And here you can see uh, the, uh, the reconstruction of the mu momentum as a function of PT, and, and I've just shown you here essentially the, the um, PT range of each of the leptons in the four lepton event. And, and you can see how important it is to, uh, to, to be able to go towards um, very low lepton PT. The lepton threshold for the, for the trading lepton in the four lepton analysis is 6 GV. Then, uh, of course, it is extremely important to be able to reconstruct and calibrate correctly the electron and photon energy. And here you have a picture of the electromagnetic calorimeter of ATLAS, which is liquid, argon, and lead. Uh, it's a sampling calorimeter, which, is, which has a crackless geometry, at least, uh, in, 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 in phi. And you can see, uh, you can see that, um, for instance, the calibration is done in three steps. First is an electronic calibration, then a Monte Carlo Gian-based uh, MVA regression, and for this, it's uh, of, um, of the energy uh, for, for uh, electromagnetic cluster, electrons or photons. And it's extremely important for this step of calibrating with the Monte Carlo that we have a very accurate description of the material upstream of the calorimeter. And finally, there's an in-situ calibration using only Z to E events. So it is extremely important for this calibration to have a very stable, uh, very stable conditions uh, of the uh, reconstruction of the energy in time. And you can see, for instance, here, either with an E over P measurement or the mass of the Z stability as a function of time, you can see it is all within 0.5 per mil. You can see it also as a function of uh, pileup, and uh, which is so the average uh, number of, uh, um, of pileup events per beam crossing. And you can see that also as a function of pileup, of course, this is extremely stable and well within 0.5 per mil. The band here is, is, is uh, showing one per mil. So, the critical aspect uh, for us in reaching a very good um, precision in the measurement of the energy of the electrons and the photons was essentially uh, the material estimate. And to be able to estimate the material, we, we made a lot of use of the calorimeter, in particular because in Atlas we have a lot of material between, um, between the ID and the calorimeter. We have the solenoid and the cryostat, which is before, between the calorimeter and the AT services. So it's extremely important to be able to measure the material which is between uh, the calorimeter and the ID, and essentially uh, upstream of the calorimeter in general. And, and for this, we're going to be using the longitudinal segmentation of the calorimeter. Usually, what, what we, what, what we, um, what we highlight in the calorimeter, we're talking about the Higgs, is the uh, is the, uh, lo the uh, lateral segmentation or the, uh, along the Z axis segmentation of the calorimeter uh, to, for the rejection of uh, photons and pi zeros. But in, in, in this case, what is crucial is the longitudinal along the, uh, the, uh, the uh, shower of the electron and photon of the calorimeter. And, and for this, it is extremely important that we have a good calibration of the various uh, layers, uh, the longitudinal layers, layers of the calorimeter. And for instance, for this, we use single muon events looking at the ionization of single muons. And you can see here uh, the uh, calibration correction that had to be done in order to have a good reproduction of the ratio of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, layer uh, energy. And then, of course, so these muons could give us easily the, the uh, layers of the, the accordion calorimeter, but it was difficult to have the pre-sampler pre calibration. And for this, we essentially use both the, uh, the, the uh, dependence of the ratio of the layers in the accordion part of the calorimeter uh, to, to the pre-sampler. And this essentially can be seen here, where the dependence of the energy in the presampler versus the energy in the calorimeter, when we are just adding material in front of the presampler, it has a linear dependence uh, that can be seen here. We had to add also the information from unconverted photons that deposit very little energy in the presampler in order to be able to, to, to uh, calibrate these curves. And once for, for, for material between the presampler and the accordion calorimeter, and once this is done, we, had, uh, we, we could um, actually simply calibrate the, the presampler energy. And so this is a very intricate analysis that actually worked very well. 
Once this is done, we can use the uh, layers of the calorimeter to actually um, measure the, uh, the material. And this is done, again, using the ratio of the energies in the calorimeter and the uh, and uncovered photons. And using, using this ratio, we, what we had observed is these types of discrepancies. So we had discrepancies in the, in the end cap part of the calorimeter. They had to be corrected. And using also measurements in the ID, we could track which parts of the calorimeter, uh, which parts of the material upstream of the calorimeter had to be correct. And for this, we've used to, we've issued a new geometry of the detector. And you can see the difference in terms of additional material in uh, uh, upstream of the calorimeter. In, in this plot, and you can see how after, after these corrections, after having a completely new description of the geometry of the detector, we had a much better uh, uh, description of, of the material. So, and then the last step of the calibration you can see here, it's the in-situ absolute scale calibration. You, you can see that we have an excellent precision. You have the error on the measurement of the co calibration coefficient made on the Z only, and then a, a, a very good um, uh, uh, line shape description, so you have data versus the Monte Carlo. And all this was, of course, validated and cross-checked using, uh, for instance, for photons, the, uh, the radiative Z photon uh, decays, and for electrons using J size in the, uh, in the low PT region. Uh, the, the, the central part here shows essentially a closure check. So this, this allowed us to make um, a very precise measurement of the Higgs boson mass and update our results that were shown already a year ago uh, on, on the first preliminary results on the Higgs boson mass. And you can see here, for instance, on the left, the four lepton mass spectrum. The analyses have been improved. For instance, in the, in the four lepton uh, analysis, there was the addition of a BDT of the, of, the, uh, of the ZZ events, which essentially makes use of the matrix element or the information of the, uh, of the spin of, of, of the Higgs, essentially. And, and, uh, and, uh, and you also have an additional correction for far FSR. And on the right, you have the spectrum of the diphotons. And here, there was a reoptimization of the analysis specifically uh, for the measurement of, uh, of the mass. And in particular, to take into account those regions which are more difficult to measure the, the mass uh, or the energy of, of photons. So you can see that uh, the measurement in the four leptons uh, is given here. The systematic uncertainty is extremely small. It's 60 MeV. It corresponds essentially to the, uh, to the uh, energy scale uh, systematic uncertainty that we have on the Z-peak, and it scales normally, which is, which is what is essentially expected. And it's completely dominated by the statistical uncertainty. And you can see in the, in the diphoton uh, mass measurement that we have a drastic, dramatic change in the statistical uncertainty and also in the systematic uncertainty. The change in the statistical uncertainty is essentially due to the fact that we have a lower signal measured after recalibration. Of course, when we recalibrate uh, uh, our events, the, uh, they each move in the mass spectrum, and the fitted uh, value of the uh, signal strength was lowered in, in this case. And I will show you in a second what, what the value is. And, and the systematic, of course, results from the fact that we have a much better calibration uh, with uh, improved uh, systematic uncertainties. Uh, you, you can note also that there's expected mass shift of 450 MeV, uh, in the, uh, which, which is due to all the calibration steps that we've shown, and these affect only photons, not the electrons. We can look at the, the combination of, uh, of these two measurements, and you can see it here. So the combined value of the mass is, is uh, for Atlas is 125.36 with this error. So it's a me measurement at a 3 per mil precision. So you can illustrate very well how we've reached the precision domain and precision uh, measurements in the Higgs uh, now. And uh, you can see here also the uh, signal strength values uh, for, the, uh, for the gamma gamma and the ZZ. And you can notice, for instance, that we have a value which is now completely compatible with one. And, uh, and, and, and this, of course, will be further discussed in, in, uh, in upcoming measurements of, uh, of the coupling properties in the diphoton channel. And uh, one word, of course, on the mass compatibility, which was uh, 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 which was observed at a level of 2.4 sigma in the, the, our previous measurement with a delta M of 2.3 GV. You can see that with the new calibration, the two measurements come closer together, 
and uh, which is, of course, <laughs> in, the, in this case, fortunate since the systematic and the, uh, the, the error is improving a lot. And you can see that the, so the, so the, the difference in mass is smaller, although the uh, uncertainty has diminished by about 20%. And the compatibility has gone down between 2.4 sigma and 1.97 sigma. So now I will turn to a, a second very large chapter of this talk, which is the measurement of the Higgs boson coupling properties uh, with, uh, with, with ATLAS. And, and of course, uh, we can start with the measurement of the cross sections. It, 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 is, it has been incredibly important that, uh, that uh, for the entire phy uh, Higgs physics program that we have measurements that are well in agreement between the data and the prediction uh, over a whole range of processes, starting from uh, uh, from the, the, the single Z production to the uh, TT bar Z uh, even production modes. So, so and, and this of course, the agreement between the data and the prediction is, is, uh, is also due to an unprecedented level of accuracy in the prediction of the uh, uh, theoretical prediction of the processes. And this is incredibly important of course. I just give here some, some example rates of, of these processes. Which, which have been uh, important to, uh, to, to cross-check the, the accuracy of our analysis, but also to calibrate the detector. And, and now you, see, you, you can see in this uh, very nice summary plot that, uh, that the, uh, the Higgs has entered them, and, and, uh, and we have, for instance, here the, the uh, glue glue fusion production process uh, uh, measurement of the cross-section. But of course, here you can note that whenever we want to measure a cross-section, the total cross-section for a process like the glue glue fusion, we need to um, assume uh, values of the standard model branching functions. So this is, this is going to be a light motif uh, along this talk. A light motif because uh, it is extremely difficult to, to know the uh, Higgs width at the LHC, the Higgs width of the standard model is 4.2 MeV. It's extremely small, so it's nice that it's small because, of course, you, you only need small couplings to a new physics to be able to have sizable branching. But, uh, of course, in at LHC, we have only access to cross sections, time branching fractions, and not to total cross sections. So we cannot uh, directly constrain the, uh, the, the width uh, at the LHC. So the, 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 and, and this is essentially because the direct measurements that have been done, and, and you can see them in the papers corresponding to the mass paper in the gamma gamma and the ZZ channel, are uh, orders of magnitude away from what the standard model width is. And you have a limit of 2.6 GV in the four lepton channel and 5 GV in the diphoton channel. So essentially, when looking at the rates of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Higgs, uh, uh, of the Higgs in, in all the categories and all the analysis we have in ATLAS, we can only measure essentially ratio of couplings or coupling modifiers, and, and this is going to be a, a large part of the discussion uh, that we'll have today. And of course, we have a vast program of looking for, um, for, uh, for rare decays and, and, and invisible decays that uh, also give us additional information on what the width of the Higgs boson is. Uh, there, there have been int very interesting ideas, new ideas, very lately about how to try to constrain the width of the Higgs boson. One was the interferometry in the diphoton channel where we see that the interferometry, the, the interference between the signal and the continuum infers a shift in mass of approximately 30 MeV for the standard model with, but this shift, this shift increases with, uh, with the PT of uh, the Higgs system. And, and using the increase of the PT of the width system and measuring this in the, uh, in the diphoton channel, we can, we can infer a limit, and this is a, a, a prospect limit of twin plus out of 200 MeV in the diphoton channel. And of course, the total width to the, uh, uh, the off-shell couplings. And I will come to this. Interpreting our data. Essentially, what the, one of the main programs of interpreting our data is to look at the signals in various analysis categories. And you have plenty of them, and I will show you uh, the, the entire picture of them in a minute. And, and interpreting in terms of signal strength uh, um, and signal strength. So you have either, uh, for each of the categories, in, in one given analysis channel, given C, and they are all ordered essentially in DK channels. So you have a modifier, either a global modifier, a modifier of the cross-section, production cross-section, or a modifier of the branching fraction. And then what we do to interpret our data is to um, link it to uh, an effective Lagrangian using uh, the following, uh, the, the following uh, parametrization with modifiers of, uh, with coupling modifiers that we call kappa. And you have here the full list that you can look at later. And using the, uh, uh, and assuming the narrow width approximation, assuming the same tensor structure of uh, the, uh, 
of the uh, observed particle with the standard model Higgs boson, then we can uh, rewrite all of these signal strengths in function as a function of the coupling modifiers. And here you have one example for the, uh, for the diphoton channel where you, uh, you make no assumptions of what is the content of the loops and, uh, and where all the uh, couplings to the standard model particles are, uh, are fixed to the, stand the standard model value. And you can see here, for instance, the parametrization of the modifier to the total width is extremely important uh, for, for all the um, uh, constraints that we want to put. Here are all the production processes, and you, you know them uh, already probably all by heart. One important uh, aspect that has to be uh, maybe emphasized is that the main production process occurs through a loop. This loop is completely dominated by, by the top quark. You have a very small interference to which it's very hard to be sensitive with, with the, the, the bottom quark. Two additional processes that uh, I would like to discuss for a second. One is the BBH uh, process, which, is, which has been, uh, which has been uh, used now in our analysis, introduced as a small correction. And the TH process, uh, which is a single top production with the Higgs. And you can see that in this case, we have a very large contribution of the interference term to this process. And you see uh, in, in this slide, I give also the, uh, the parametrization of each of the processes as a function of the coupling modifiers. Same for the, uh, same for the uh, decay uh, um, rates. And you can see, for instance, how they can be parametrized. And, uh, and, and here as well, I would like to emphasize the fact that in the decay of the, uh, of the Higgs to the diphoton, you can see that we have, uh, we have um, an interference between the W, which is the dominant uh, loop process in the decay of the Higgs in two photons, and the top. And you see that this interference is very, very large, and, and uh, it will imply that, that, uh, uh, that we, we've, we've, we've tried to corner better the sign, the relative sign between the top and the W. You will see this in a, in a minute. So here is the global picture of all the analysis channels that we've treated at, at, uh, in ATLAS. So, uh, of course, each of these channels, each of these box has several categories and is fitting a lot of the data. So it's an incredibly intricate, uh, um, um, uh, uh, complex uh, overall scheme of analysis that has to be combined together. And of course, I will not go through a description of each of them, but I will just give you some of the highlights in these analyses. And in red here, I have all the channels that have been combined. And you see that one of the invisible channels has also been combined here. So the first, one of the first highlights I would like to give is the uh, analysis of the search for the Higgs boson into, uh, tau, uh, into a tau pair, tau pair. And this is an intricate channel because you have to look for two taus. It, it has to rely also on the challenging tau triggers. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and it has to discriminate an intricate um, uh, background, which is made essentially of uh, Z to tau tau and fakes. And uh, uh, you can see, for instance, here in the analysis, uh, this analysis is using an MVA to discriminate the signal and the background, and you can see the high level of, uh, of purity of the signal events that it's reached in this analysis. And, 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 uh, and this inform the information which is, uh, which is uh, in this analysis through the MVA that is used does not make a very precise use of the, uh, of the mass information. So we ad uh, added this plot here to show the compatibility of the excess that we've seen using the MV analysis with the 125 GV Higgs boson. And you see that we've made an observation which is uh, at the 4.1 sigma level of, uh, of a signal in this channel, which is compatible with the expected 3.2 sigma uh, uh, for, for the standard model Higgs boson. So here you have a summary of all the channels that have been already combined. And you can see here that this, the combined signal strength, and when we do this, we assume both the branching fraction of the standard model and the production cross sections within the errors. And you see that the combination has compatibility of the channels at the level of 14%. And you can see that the, uh, the, the, the overall mu has, uh, which is slightly high, but is, um, is relatively compatible with one has a contribution to the theory systematic, which is sizable. And one of the dominant uh, parts of this theory systematic is PDF. And you can see that this is going to probably be reduced soon, uh, as we're using, for the moment, a prescription that takes the envelope of several PDF measurements, which are not completely compatible together. And finally, you can look also at the measurement of the signal strength in each of the, cha of the channels. In particular, look at the signal strength of the uh, glue, glue fusion process versus the VBF. And this gives you, the, in, in, a, in a just one simple view, the relative importance of each of the channels in, 
in constraining uh, each of the processes. And you can see, for instance, that uh, the, the, uh, most of the processes are more sensitive to the glue-glue fusion, except for one, which is the tartar, which is shown here. So now, combining all these channels, we, we could reach uh, this type of fit, and you can see the impact of each of the channels. For instance, taking, assuming that there's no BSM in the production and decay of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Higgs, and then just fitting the couplings. And we see that we are, we are, we are well compatible uh, with the uh, standard model. And you see also that the relative sign between the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the coupling to the fermions and to the vector boson uh, are, are still, uh, still somewhat ambiguous. We looked at also at the ratio of the couplings to Ws and Z bosons, and this is to test the custodial symmetry. And we, we do this test, we perform this test on the various conditions, for instance, assuming or not that, uh, or taking into account or not the uh, indirect coupling of the, uh, of the Higgs to, uh, to top quarks, to the loops in the, in the gamma gamma. And if we, if we do so, then, then uh, we, we, we have slightly different measurements, but all are, are compatible with, uh, with, uh, with a ratio of coupling equals one, uh, so to the custodial symmetry. And finally, using the uh, results from the, uh, from the uh, couplings to fermions, in particular in the tau, uh, in tau tau channel, we can, we, we can actually measure the, uh, the ratio of the couplings of the uptype quark and the downtime quarks, where the uptype quarks are mostly um, uh, constrained from the, uh, from the top quark loop in the gamma gamma channel, and the downtype uh, uh, fermions from the, from the, type, from the, uh, from the tau tau channel. And this allows so to measure this ratio, and using this ratio also reinterpret the fits in, in uh, for instance, the MSSM plane, where it is extremely important in to HDMs to have uh, the uh, to, uh, to to have the relative couplings of the up and down time uh, fermions. And another important uh, interpretation of the fit of the Higgs, uh, of the standard model Higgs in, the, uh, in all the standard model channels is to look what is uh, in the loop, just, just fitting uh, effective loops, so we're not now uh, reparameterizing the loops in terms of their, their content in fields, but just fitting the, uh, the, uh, an effective coupling to the gluons and to the, and to the photons. And you can see that we are essentially compatible <laughs> at, at the two sigma level with, with, the, with the standard model value. And this, again, this tension is due to the, what was an excess in the, in the gamma gamma channel. And then we can also free the width uh, in, in, in this fit. And freeing the width, we typically interpret this in terms of uh, branching to uh, invisible or undetected uh, particles. And we have a limit at 41% using this, uh, this fit. But it, this is completely equivalent to putting actually a limit on the total width of the Higgs, and this corresponds to about 7 MeV. And finally, we can also bring into the analysis, as I shown at the beginning, an invisible uh, Higgs analysis. And you can see here, for instance, a channel where the, the, the Higgs is produced uh, in, um, uh, associated to a, a Z decay into a pair of leptons. And of course, in this analysis, it's crucial to have a good description of the missing ET, which is taken as the final discriminating variable and yields a limit of 65% on the uh, invisible branching fraction. And this, we can then combine the invisible channels with the visible channels and put a, 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 a much improved limit. You can, see the, you can see the expectation in the limit going to 39% on the invisible branching fraction with an observed at 37%. We can then interpret these limits on uh, invisible branching fractions of the Higgs boson in terms of, uh, of cross-sections of cross sections uh, out, of cross sections um, uh, 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 of uh, nucleon with dark matter, and this is into a pure Higgs portal interpretation. I will just briefly flash some of also very important results, such, such as the search for the Higgs into the Daimyon channel, and this is for the searches for rare decays where we're not seeing a signal already tells us that the couplings of the Higgs to fermions is non universal. And the search for the Higgs in the Z gamma channel, where, uh, where also this channel will, will, will bring us uh, in the future uh, very interesting, important information about the Higgs couplings. Another analysis highlight that I, I will briefly touch based on is the TTH uh, BB channel. And this is uh, to be able to corner the top Yukawa coupling, which is an extremely important component. And to do so directly, we, we, we need to uh, uh, resort to this type of channels, which are extremely complex, where you see that we have uh, essentially six jets with four B quarks in the final state. And of course, 
controlling the, uh, the background of the, uh, the TT bar plus jet and TT bar plus heavy flavor is extremely important. And of course, this is what we do, and we do this in, in, into breaking up uh, the channel into several categories, into number of jets and number of, of B tags jets in these categories. And you see that the relative amount of, uh, of backgrounds in each of these uh, categories allows us to constrain and to measure these, uh, these backgrounds. So for instance, one important number that you will find in our paper is the measurement of the TTBB, which is done at 13%. And the TTBB uh, background, and here you see, for instance, the impact of each of the systematic uncertainties, such as the normalization of TTBB uh, uh, background, has on the analysis and is the top one. So it is, of course, extremely important. This we knew since a long time that the TTBB be tamed, and, and, we, and it is now constrained at the 13% uh, percent level, which allowed us to do this, this analysis. So, so light rejection is, of course, also extremely important in this analysis. And then we use, in this, each of these categories, you can see that we have different signal over background ratio and different sensitivities, and this allows, of course, to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, discriminate the signal to, from the background, and, and, uh, and adding discrimination from either the, uh, uh, the HT variable with total energy, transverse energy, uh, or, or an MVA in the most significant uh, regions, allows us to have this, uh, this, uh, this very nice discrimination between signal over, over background. And you, see, you can see the, uh, the, uh, the uh, sensitivity that has been reached, and you can see that combining the, uh, the two main channels, which is the lepton plus jets and the dilepton channels, we reach a measurement of 1.7, uh, measurement, uh, a, a constraint on the, on the signal strength of 1.7 plus or minus 1.4. Then I will just briefly flash what, what has been done in the gamma gamma channel. You can see, for instance, that uh, we, we, uh, this is a much simpler analysis where the contribution of the background is directly obtained from the sidebands, so it's more robust in, 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 in that sense. And, and you see that, for instance, the impact of the systematic uncertainties here is the results of the two analyses, the TTHBB and the TTH gamma gamma. This, the impact of the systematic uncertainty is much less. Uh, and and, uh, and it, its sensitivity is, of course, um, statistically dominated and, and, and uh, not, yet, uh, uh, not yet really competitive. You can see also that the, uh, this analysis can be uh, reinterpreted in terms of TH production, and we can place a limit on the TH production cross-sections and, and looking at the limit of the TH production cross-section as a function of the uh, top Yukawa coupling modifier, we can see that we can start excluding the values uh, of uh, the top Yukawa coupling modifiers, which are negative. The limit is not quite there. It's at uh, minus 1.3. I'm sorry, I haven't put it here. And, uh, but but, but it's, 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 getting, it's getting there. Finally, another way to, uh, to better understand and to uh, measure the properties of the couplings of the Higgs is not only looking at the rates, but also looking at differential cross-sections. And here I show two examples which are extremely important. This is done in the four lepton channel and in the diphoton channel. And you can see two extremely important variables, which are the PT of the Higgs and the, the, the number of, uh, of jets produced along with the Higgs. This has been, the differential distribution has been looked at in uh, various uh, variables and observables, and, 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 and a way to look at the uh, global picture of this differential distribution is to look at the uh, um, first and second moments of this distribution, which is essentially the mean and the RMS of, of, of them. And, and you can see uh, the agreement between the data which is placed at the center and values of the, uh, the, uh, the predictions. And finally, also, just to illustrate, the, the differential cross-section can tell us much more than only, uh, only uh, properties in the couplings. They can tell us, and this has been used, they can tell us, of course, about the spin and the CP properties. So there's a huge program that is, uh, that is uh, now uh, has, has, has already started, and you can see it both in our differential cross-section in the measurement that we've done in the past. I, have, I, I didn't speak at all about the measurement of spin and parity uh, in the atlas, but, but they are based on, on this type of observable that, uh, that, that are used as discriminant in this case. So I will, I will finish um, <clears throat> with uh, a new measurement that we've done, which is the measurement of the off-shell signal strength. And uh, using this, this measurement of the off-shell signal strength, there's actually a limit on this off-shell signal strength of the Higgs to constrain the Higgs boson width. And this is done in the four lepton channel. 
And you can see here, for instance, the spectrum in mass of uh, the, uh, the, the Higgs, and you can see, of course, the very, uh, the very uh, narrow width of the Higgs in the on-shell part of it. But you can see that because of the threshold of the ZZ and the TT bar, there's a large improve, in, increase in the uh, cross-section as a function of the uh, four lepton mass uh, for the, for the four lepton channel here for the, for the Higgs. And this can be seen, uh, this, this, this is what we would try to measure. And when we do so, of course, looking at the very off-shell region, then we're looking at the Higgs as a propagator and not anymore as, a, as, as the particle with, with a given width. So we are not anymore dependent on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the total width of the Higgs. And this is what is going to be used. This is the property that's going to be used to measure the, uh, the uh, or constrain the total width of the Higgs. And, and one of the, the intricacies of this analysis is that the signal has, uh, has a background which is, uh, which is, which is the uh, direct production of the, uh, of the ZZ in, uh, with, uh, from two gluons, which interferes with it. And what you can see, for instance, here you have the signal, you have then the glue-glue uh, to uh, ZBB, which is here in the yellow, it's not very visible. But you can see that when you add the two with the Sander model, we, you don't have an increase of the, of the rate and the high mass region, but you have a tiny decrease of the, of, the, of the signal rate in the high mass region. Of course, this tendency is uh, reversed when we go to very high uh, uh, total width of the Higgs, where we increase a lot this cross-section of shell of the, of, the, of the Higgs, but not the one from the, uh, from the continuum. Nevertheless, the, the, the most important background in this analysis is not the glue-glue to ZZ, but is the QQ to ZZ. And you can see here, for instance, we use to discriminate it two analyses, one in the four leptons and one in the uh, two leptons, two neutrinos, so dilepton plus missing ET. And, 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 and we've tried, one of the intricacies also of this analysis is that description of the glue-glue to ZZ continuum is, is known uh, only at leading order. And, and we wanted to, be, to have analyses which are as independent of the PT as possible. And uh, for instance, either in the four lepton we're using the uh, matrix element and the four lepton discriminant. And in, in the 2L to new channel we, where we have to put a cut on the missing ET, we just use a counting experiment. So here are the results, and, and we've, we've, we're showing our results agnostic to the K factor on the, uh, on the, uh, on the glue glue to ZZ uh, continuum, and, and we show the limit as a function of it. So this is not a systematic uncertainty in our analysis. What do we, where we do have a systematic uncertainty is on the interference between the, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the continuum and the Higgs signal, and it's at the level of 30%. So we can put a limit on the off-shell couplings at uh, 6.7 times the standard model expectation for the ex uh, off-shell couplings, and we, we take the value of the ratio of the K factor is, is expressed as a function of the ratio of the K factor of the continuum to the Higgs signal, and what we do is that we take a ratio of one for the for our nominal analysis, and this is uh, this is corroborated by the by the uh, uh, estimate of this K factor using the soft collinear approximation by this author. And then using the, the limit of shell and this analysis framework, now what we can do is to fit both the on-shell and the, uh, both the on-shell part and the off-shell part of the spectrum. And uh, in this case, uh, assuming that the on-shell and the off-shell uh, signal strengths are the same. And when we do so, since the, uh, the off-shell part is independent of the width, we can put a direct uh, uh, limit on, on the total width. And the combination of the two gives um, a limit at 5.7 times the uh, total width of the Higgs, while 8.5 is expected. So I, have, I had just a few uh, examples also of the use of the Higgs boson as a tool for discovery and, and searches for additional Higgs boson. I will just flash them uh, very quickly. So for instance, looking at the decays of the top to the, uh, to the Higgs uh, with flavor changing uh, neutral current, so the top to X plus uh, either up type quark or C quark. The uh, search for, for, for di Higgs production, so, so for instance, a new analysis of the Higgs, uh, Higgs production in the BB gamma gamma channel, where we have um, a, a limit either on the non resonant production, and, and, and this is then further pushed to a limit on the on resonant production of uh, two Higgses. And you see here the limit given as a function of the uh, uh, di-Higgs mass or the, or the X mass here. And finally, also search for additional states, for instance, looking not only towards the high mass using the gamma-gamma channel, but also towards the low masses. 
so be, be, beneath the, uh, be beneath the, uh, the, the, the uh, around 110 GeV threshold that we were using up to now, and down to 65 GeV. So covering also the mass range around 98 GeV, where there was an interesting uh, 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 excess uh, observed at less at the level of two sigma. And finally, just an example also of the search for charged Higgs bosons. And for a complete overview of all the searches, here you, can, you, you have a list with the references. So just to, just to, to illustrate to you a very complete program of searches that we have in Atlas. And finally, there was a very nice talk about the prospect by Heiner uh, Camacho that you can, you can look at. And, and, uh, and, uh, and just to say that, of course, the prospects are incredibly important for us. And, and, and now we're focusing on run two, and you can see here, for instance, the insertion of the insertable B-layer, which has been inserted, and it will bring us um, a much improved rejection, for instance, of light jets. And you have, you have seen, for instance, that this is an extremely important part of the TTH analysis. So I will conclude. We're celebrating now the second anniversary of the Higgs discovery. The LHC and the Atlas Higgs physics program has really immensely expanded in, the, in Higgs physics. And now it's really in the, uh, in the measurement and the uh, search for additional states phase. And uh, we have a large variety of results and properties, searches for additional Higgs bosons, searches for new state physics through the Higgs boson that has been presented. <coughs> There's also an emerging uh, effective field theory framework uh, to test the, uh, the compatibility of the recently discovered Higgs to the, uh, with the standard model in general and beyond the, the, the frontier of the Higgs. <coughs> So the LHC, the LHC run one was really an immense success, and we're looking forward to preparing the, the run two. And there will be more results, so stay tuned in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marini. So we have time for only a few questions. Yes. Pardon me, so you showed these differential cross-sections in Higgs to gamma gamma, and it looks like all data points were well above predictions. Can you comment on that? Oh, yes. Yes, you, so you're looking at which on the PT, for instance? Yes, correct. So, so you were saying that they all point at? They are all above, so is yes. it just you? <laughs> The future will tell us. <laughs> the future will tell us. It's hard, it's hard, to, it's hard to judge for now. It's clearly, there's a, there's a, but there's the a trend. Blue, blue bands are covering systematics on, on, the, on, on the theoretical predictions? Let, let's say that the statistics are covering more of the difference <laughs> than, the, than the systematic on the, on, on the theory prediction, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, so I actually had the question of on uh, about the same plot, so there's clear dis uh, disagreement, so, and you also tell about uh, using kinematic distributions in searches for uh, physics beyond the standard model, so in principle, so there's additional kick to the uh, Higgs system, so gamma-gamma system, so what can possibly produce this? Okay, so so yeah, as, 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 as I didn't have time to, to dwell on this really, but the... Yeah, if, if this were to be confirmed in future measurements, it is going to be, in, of course, incredibly interesting because you're testing directly the, uh, the, the PT of the Higgs, which is dependent on the loop. For instance, there are very interesting papers showing the impact of the B, the B loop in the, in, this, in, the, in the PT distribution. So it'd be extremely interesting to measure this more precisely. For the moment, we don't consider this as an as a extremely significant discrepancy. But of course, of course, we, we, we will follow it up, yes. And for instance, yes, a, a large contribution of, of, of the B loop would be, would be interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so the last question, and then we have to move on. So one of the changes for that regard the mass measurements in X for lepton is that now you, for the electrons, you combine uh, to the calorimeter energy estimation, the track estimation. Can you say which is, which w what was the impact of this change, or if uh, you improved the resolution, or uh, if it shifted the the mass measurement or not? Yeah, it. So I mean, the shift is uh, is so. Yeah, the 
I mean, the, the use of the, of the track uh, information is, uh, has not uh, shifted, the, uh, has not an expected shift because all this is, of course, calibrated. But, the, but uh, uh, indeed, some of the events uh, have, have uh, gone out. One of the events among the uh, list of Turkish events that are there has gone out because of this reason. Only one. So, so really, the change is very small. Yeah. Okay. But, but it, does, it does contribute to this uh, shift here. Because it's, it's really only very few events that, 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 that do make uh, this little change. Okay, thank you very much, Marumi, again. Thank you.